Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show, recording live on Saturday for the second time, January 4th, 2020. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 46. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have an exodus of people from California and Amazon opens its first homeless shelter in Seattle. But first, check a look at this. This was the scene in Washington State on New Year's Eve. Several vehicles, including a semi truck, were trapped on a highway. Strong winds blew the tumbleweeds onto the road. Authorities say the piles were as high as 20 or 30 feet in some places. That's right. 20 or 30 feet piles of tumbleweeds in Washington State blowing over some cars. Well, not blowing over the cars, but blowing on top of cars. And these cars are buried in these tumbleweeds. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. If you are watching or sorry, listening to the audio podcast, definitely check out the video podcast. It is crazy because it's, it really is buried. (laughs) By tumbleweeds. Crews worked through the night to clear the roadway. It finally reopened early yesterday morning. No injuries. Wow. That's a semi. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of tumbleweeds there. Washington state. We had a lot of high winds up here. Yeah, I think we uh, heard them at night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. wind is whoosh, yeah. just blowing. Blowing, blowing across hard. the whole state. <laughs> yep. Staying in Washington, KIRO 7 News. Thousands of Seattle students told to get vaccinated. The Seattle School District is warning thousands of parents that their children will not be allowed to attend school after this Christmas break unless they comply with Washington's new laws on vaccines. Kyra Summons' Runchy Sinna was in South Seattle this morning where the first in a series of vaccination clinics was held. School notified us something we had to get done. Um, we didn't want her to miss school. But. I just wanted to make sure we were good. <laughs> Some of the parents in this line say they're not taking any chances when it comes to vaccination. They are taking Seattle Public Schools warning seriously to get all the shots for their kids so they can stay in school. Seattle Public Schools says about 2,000 students are not up to date on shots or paperwork. Some students are... 2,000 students in the district. Wow. That's a lot of students yeah. that are not up to date. Damn are missing the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, Washington lawmakers did vote to get rid of personal and philosophical exemptions for MMR after two personal and philosophical exemptions for MMR. Outbreaks of measles in the state. Those outbreaks sickened 87 people. State law now says that school districts can exclude students that are out of compliance. Seattle will start excluding students January 8th. If any students show up on that uh, on the 8th and they don't have their records up to date, they'll be put aside in a room. Their parents will be contacted wow. to come and collect the, the students. Wow, so your kids can be thrown into a yeah. room if they're not vaccinated. Jeez. But according to an article, NBC News, Washington state lawmakers voted to get rid of the personal or philosophical exemptions from the MMR vaccine after two measles outbreaks sickened 87 people and sent the state into a state of emergency. However, students still may receive exemptions for medical or religious reasons. Good job. Wait. <laughs> you say you could still, you just Isn't... say, you just have to bypass and just yeah. say, no, it's a, it's a medical or religious reason. Don't worry about it. Isn't philosophical and religious kind of similar? And oh well, yeah, well, you know, personal usually implies medical or yeah. <laughs> so what? What did what did they do? What are our lawmakers do? <laughs> and I don't feel like the state of Washington's in a state of emergency, but I don't know. We just live yeah. here. Don't know. Don't That's know too much. Our boots on the ground. <laughs> yeah, our boots on the ground. Report not in a state of emergency. <laughs> Business Insider staying in Seattle. A homeless shelter is about to open inside Amazon's headquarters. Its director says it's not on corporations to solve the homelessness problem. When the shelter first, excuse me, when the shelter opens in the first quarters of 2020, it will have the capacity to serve 275 people each night. That's a small portion of the local homeless population, about 12,500 people in King County, where Seattle is located, but it's expected to be the largest family shelter in Washington state. The space is located across the street from Amazon Spheres, a prominent glass, uh, prominent glass domes that double as an employee workspace and greenhouse. Seattle saw a considerable rise in rents and home prices after Amazon built its campus there in 2010. From 2007 to 2017, the median rent in Seattle increased by nearly 42% compared to 18% nationwide. Homelessness in Seattle has also risen by 9% each year since 2014. The shelter will be run by Mary's Place, a nonprofit that has worked with the company for years. Amazon has offered to pay for the space's utilities, maintenance, and security for the next 10 years, or as long as Mary's Place needs it. It's also covering the rent. Mary's Place will be responsible for funding its own operations, programming, and staff the space. The organization told City Lab that those expenses could amount to $2 million a year. 
In the article, the nonprofit executive director, Mary Hartman, said it's not on corporations to solve Seattle's homelessness problem and that the issue is a lack of affordable housing. So, what does that mean exactly? So, is it government's issue? Amazon's issue? Mm. In Seattle, Amazon moved in. <laughs> City couldn't keep up. Traffic increased dramatically in Seattle after Amazon yeah. moved in. That's no secret. And so it's the city's responsibility now just to put up all these new roads and do, do what they have. I, yeah. Well, who approved the contract for yeah. Amazon to come in and yeah. who was supposed to build that infrastructure? Well, should have <laughs> Amazon pay for it or maybe think about it a little bit. Something's, yeah. something's not right in Seattle. Well, I find it a little disturbing, too, that the executive director of this is saying that it's not on corporations. Well, yeah. then what's the point? Of this homeless shelter, if you're not trying to solve the problem. Well, because she works with Amazon and <laughs> help her. So she's saying, hey, but it's not a corporation's problem. It's government's yeah. issue. Affordable housing. Affordable housing. There's more affordable housing, everybody. That's what we need. More affordable housing for everybody. But then, so this is just virtual. Virtue signaling on yeah. Amazon's part. Since Probably. <laughs> they avoided that head tax that Seattle wanted to impose on them. Where, like I said, employee mm -hmm. head tax, they would have been screwed. Yeah. Because yeah. it's only serving a very small portion the homeless population. Yeah, it's so. not. It's it sounds like a waste of money. Yeah. Yep. Moving on to New York. Democracy now. New York City jail visitor invasive searches. In New York, the city's agreed to pay twelve point five million dollars to settle a class action lawsuit with people who are subjected to invasive strip searches while visiting family members and loved ones in jails in Manhattan. Brooklyn, and Rikers Island. Many of the women reported being penetrated by female guards or forced to drop their pants and show their sanitary napkins. The settlement... That is awful. Yeah. <laughs> what the wow. hell? That is highly invasive. Just <laughs> to the visit people in jail? Yeah. The first time New York will pay damages to visitors of jails who've long raised concerns about the invasive and humiliating strip searches. Good use of tax dollars there. Nice settlement to cover up the perverts searching people in the jails in yeah. New York, apparently. Did they uh, address the actual issue there? No, <laughs> no. Just paid a settlement and okay. say, stop doing that. Bad. <laughs> you should be in there. Yeah. Like, basically raping people. CNBC television. Oh, move on to California. California lost residents last year. The nation's largest economy, California, is losing a generation of wage earners. Jane Wells joins us now from Los Angeles to explain where they're going, Jane. Hi, Mike. Yeah, uh, it's not just large companies like Charles Schwab leaving California. The census numbers do not lie. All kinds of young professionals, some of them making decent salaries, are leaving too. Take, for example, 30-year-old Sydney Mulkey. She was an educator in Oakland making about 58 grand. Got moved to Portland. 58,000 in Oakland? Good uh, luck. Yeah. In Oregon, got the same job at 70 grand, allowing her to buy a brand new condo, something that never would have happened in California. At one point, I was working three jobs, <laughs> and I was just really tired. So <laughs> Sounds like California. Kind of... Yeah, everyone's tired in California. Yeah, and working two, three jobs. Yep. The last straw. Small business owners Danielle and Scott Fortier moved from L.A. to Nashville because they couldn't afford to save for retirement or their kids' college funds, even though Scott was working 80 hours a week at his own business in L.A. Look at this. They owned a 3,100-square-foot house on a small lot. In Tennessee, they own a larger house on seven acres. By the way, their house on seven acres looks kind of like a mansion to me. It doesn't yeah. really look like a house. It's That's a very deep. large house. <laughs> I don't know how, what, 7,000 square feet or something? That's a very large house. I've, ne I've been in very few houses of that size. Yeah. With the building to run their business out of no state income taxes, property taxes a third of what they were in California, health insurance costs cut nearly in half. We've been here about six months, and in that six months, we've already had six friends of ours, six couples, relocate to the same area also. People have this image of all these old people who are frustrated leaving, but actually the ones who are leaving are, are family age people, people 30 to 54, that group, that's the group that's leaving. We just yeah. left California because yeah. it's too expensive. It's, it's true. true. It is too damn expensive. Yeah. 190,000 people left California last year. That is, wow. I, I believe it. It's too expensive. You yeah. can't buy anything. Yeah. You can't even afford your rent. That's why you have to work two, three jobs. Yeah, just to afford rent. That's yeah, not land but, ownership. That's not, you're yeah. just continuously paying rent forever. And that's not being able to save towards a dream of, build a life so yeah. it makes sense that these millennials yeah are leaving people are leaving just in general yeah yeah 
30 to 54 year olds, according to that guy. Yeah. Going back to September 18th, 2019, Fox 5, San Diego activists call for an end to smart streetlights in San Diego. Mixed reaction to the installation of over 4,000 sensors that are watching, listening, and collecting real-time data on the people of San Diego every second of every day. Can they do that, though, without posting signs about recording audio and stuff like that? The San Diego City Council approved the installation in 2016. According to the city's website, the smart streetlights help save money and increase public safety. You cannot use these smart streetlights any further. But in a press conference Tuesday morning, a group of organizations. I like how there's a scooter to the right of this shot oh, in that video. Yeah, that's perfect. What the hell? It's one of those bird, yeah. bird scooters. Somebody rode one yeah. of those bird scooters in and just parked it right there. Can it, can't get out the damn shot. They park those damn things everywhere. Yeah. Well, what that, the hell? That's the problem. Maybe they had to already clear them. <laughs> spoke out against the technology. What is very concerning and troubling is that these cameras were installed and are being used all over this city without any oversight. Jones Wright says the perceived lack of oversight paired with the capabilities of the technology should be cause for alarm. Oh, yeah. NBC News, San Diego City is hiding data from smart streetlights lawsuit claims. So these streetlights, there's 4,000 streetlights that have cameras equipped on them. And GE owns the streetlights and the cameras. So they're supposed to, they think, this activist group thinks that maybe GE has the data? I don't know. It's kind of yeah. confusing. Everyone's yeah. pointing the finger. We don't have this. We don't, it's recording and nobody wants to turn over the information. So I have a quote here. Briggs, who currently is running for city attorney, has criticized the program and the potential use of that data by a third party. My clients are deeply disturbed, as all San Diegans should be, by the fact that the city is gathering data about everyone's comings and goings. But then the only people that can see the data are mega corporations making millions by selling that very same data, Briggs said. The city and General Electric, the parent group of the company that owns the cameras, deny the data was shared by any third parties. The data collector from those nodes is exclusively owned by the city, and any assertion otherwise is wholly inaccurate, read a statement from General Electric. Unless explicitly instructed to do so by the city in accordance with all applicable law currently, does not provide the data of the third party, a General Electric team spokesperson said. In, like, paragraph, it's, I don't know. Do they have the data? Do they not have the data? I don't know. I'm confused. Yeah, it, Who has the data? These cameras are recording. Let's see the data. This is public information. These are public streetlights. What's going on? I, I don't know. San Diego. Yeah, very strange. Leave San Diego. Oh, there was also another quote in mm -hmm. that article that didn't make any sense because it said, any intellectual property referred to as process data belongs to GE. This is similar to when you buy a cell phone. You own the photos and the text you create with the cell phone, but you do not own the intellectual property rights of the software on the phone that enabled you to generate those things. So yeah. who owns the data? Yeah. <laughs> They're all pointing the... <laughs> They're still... <laughs> the people own yeah. the data. Oh. Get rid of the cameras. How did that yeah. get past some? Well, and I guess two city councilmen are now are saying, "Oh well, we need to put a hold on all this because uh, we, you guys approved the contract. This all went through. Yeah. They got installed. You guys, you who's overseeing these contracts getting approved? Well, and why are the cameras being on? What is what is going on? It bothers me because they put them as smart street lights that somehow there's gonna learn the patterns of yeah. people so that they can be on more efficient. How does that make sense? Shouldn't they just be on when it's dark? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't more know. efficient power. <laughs> and then just get efficient LED light bulbs. Yeah, well, well why they probably do, we... do have LEDs. <laughs> well, LEDs they, and yeah. photo cells that can just let you know yeah. when it's dark or. But, if they're so smart, they can be connected to the internet. You could program them with timers. Yeah, why do they need to have cameras collecting all this data? It's to spy on people. Yeah. Sensors to spy on people. In terms of smart technology. Yep. Smart means what? Bull. Yeah, it's all bullshit. <laughs> uh, moving on. Yep. The Washington Post. America's marijuana growers are the best in the world, but federal laws are keeping them out of the global market. Man. This was, once again, regulations hit. Yeah. So, of course, because marijuana is legal in many states, but still illegal federally, marijuana growers are unable to ship their products to other countries or even other American states that will legalize the drug. So while U.S. cannabis firms have driven product innovation and mastered large-scale grow operations, they restlessly wait for the export, export curtain to lift. So this is really unfortunate. So yes, they're, it is. They're saying that the U.S., they're the 
best marijuana in the world. Of course, yeah. we've talked about how California is, California is the king of weed. Yeah, nobody <laughs> competes with California, so it's just. Ex- <laughs> Nope. But who's dominating the foreign market? Canada. So Canada, they recently legalized marijuana, if you remember. And so now they... They're exporting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're now the dominant exporter in the burgeoning global marijuana trade. So that's been estimated at $14.9 billion In sales. For from exporting. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's- Good job, United <laughs> States. We missed out on $14.9 billion, $14. billion collectively. Or just California. You could just export. Damn it. There's another little great tidbit in that article that said that so when Canada legalized marijuana in 2018, they could be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. American companies are not listed. Yeah, you can't even have banks. Yeah, you, you can't, can't even be in the bank. Yes. You, can't have a, yeah, it, you can't have a bank account. It's it all cash that, only. But it's very difficult for the marijuana yeah. to get Canada banking. just opened up their business. Yeah. They were having like a lottery for dispensaries, I think. But nationwide, they just said, screw it, no more of this. Dang. We're just going to do at will issue. Bam, bam, bam. Come on in. If you're qualified, come on in. Yeah. That is great. They're going to... And, but the best weed's in California, so yeah. once well, California comes into the game, everyone's going to go down because well, California weed is really good. So the American markets, uh, some of them want to get acquired by Canadian companies. Ooh. So it could be interesting. Yeah, so what yeah. if those California companies get some Canadian investors just yeah, saying? Yeah, get some export and some trade deals going on. <laughs> yeah. You got to get the government involved. You got to tax everything. got to make now, it real complicated. Or we just need to get rid of it, federally legalize marijuana. They'll be ready to export, baby. Decriminalize it all. Yeah. yeah. Get it off the, make it not illegal. Um, Let's see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't we always complaining that America needs to make stuff again? We yeah, grow we weed. We can grow weed. We can export Let's that around it. the world. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of markets that we could tap into with the weed. <laughs> Let's do it. As a country. Ready? Yep. PBS NewsHour. Millennials are leaving organized religion. Here's where some are finding community. A Sunday service that is part therapy session. Imagine how that would change the trajectory of your life. Part stand-up comedy routine. I was this, and then I was this, and now I'm this. <laughs> Give a little dream. And part live concert. Give a little dream of my life for you. What's up, guys? How are you? All followed by a round of beers with your pastor in a rented CrossFit gym. This is not your grandmother's idea of church. We want everyone to be able to hear the good news, so we had something right in the back. Do you have good news? So, uh, I'm super Welcome to New Abbey, a Christian, LGBTQ affirming, progressive, family friendly church in Pasadena, California. God, we thank you all of the time. It was started six years ago in the living room of this guy. For all of the ways that we don't believe that we're human enough or good enough. Or Corey okay Marquez enough, is a 34 year old ordained pastor who left a larger stars, evangelical congregation enough. after he saw and many of his own friends were no longer interested in attending church. Why would none of his friends no longer be interested in attending church? What's wrong with church, hmm. you ask? <laughs> Me mean someone who doesn't like church? I don't <laughs> ask that question, but some people might. When you were talking to your friends about why they didn't go to church, what were you hearing from them? This isn't relevant for me. Sexuality, that's a big one. Like the church is not honestly talking about sexuality. You can ask my wife. Interesting. Sexuality is not a taboo topic here. Marquez's fellow pastor, Brittany Barron, speaks openly with the congregation about being a lesbian. And many of those who attend are from the LGBTQ community. The congregation has grown from 20 to 400 over the last several years. It's less about form and more about content, that people want something that actually matters for their lives. So if the content is literally not healing you, connecting you to something bigger, then you're wasting your time. According to an October report from the Pew Research Center, 76% of the baby boomer generation describe themselves as Christians. In contrast, only half of millennials identify as Christians. Four in 10 say they are religiously unaffiliated, and one in 10 identify with non-Christian faiths. Some of those turned off. Very interesting. Yeah. People are pushing away from church. And it's interesting that he says it's like sexuality and that is why a lot of people are pushing away from church because a lot of sexual repression comes from church. That's true. Like shame about masturbation or just anything sexually. It's yeah. coming from the church. So quite interesting. Hmm. Maybe there's a balance there somewhere. Seems like it. Going back in the clip just a little bit. 
identify with non-Christian faiths. Some of those turned off by traditional religions continue to seek fulfillment in other ways. According to Pew, 3 in 10 adults ages 18 to 49 now identify as spiritual but not uh-huh. religious. The well, spiritual. Yeah, everybody's spiritual. Everybody's spiritual. Everybody's yeah. spiritual. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, man. Bro. I- Spiritual. Everyone's all about good energy. And energy, manifesting. It's I'm going to cool. manifest it all. Practices and beliefs have been growing since the 1960s and 70s. The internet and social media have played a big role in the spread among younger generations. More than 60% of adults, ages 18 to 49, have at least one New Age belief, according to Pew. And many are turning to new horoscope apps and online astrologers oh, for yeah. guidance. And astrology is a pseudoscience and is not yeah. real, and we already know that. So anyone who's turning to that is just admitting that it's it's all bullshit. It doesn't matter. It's your bullshit. We it's all just keep true. it. Just whatever you ra- whatever you do to rationalize it to yourself. People spend big money on those crystals. And yeah, instead that. of spending money and time at traditional churches, millennials yeah. are spending money on expensive rocks and expensive churches at CrossFit gyms that you drink <laughs> beer at. That's fine. We all do it. Whatever. Do you? Hey, millennials love pairing beer with everything. So. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. Millennials will pair beer with anything. That's true. That's a that's a good way to lend us out, get, lead us out. We good? Think so. All right, show us some love. Yeah, no bullshit here at Healthy Talk Show. So help support independent media where you can hear the real truth from honest people like us. So head on over to healthytalkshow.com slash support. Show us some love. We need your love and support to help keep us going. That's healthytalkshow.com slash support. And another way to show us love is to contact us. Ask at healthytalkshow.com. That's our email. And healthytalkshow.com forward slash discord to communicate us direct with us directly and to submit any stories and all that good stuff. We record Healthy Talk Show live Mondays and usually Fridays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash live. Love and light. Love and light.